So uh, a few more things that I wanted to mention. Uh, on the one hand, there's the AIDA plugin cutter. I already said you can either just clone the GitHub repository of AIDA diff, or you can use this AIDA plugin cutter. So let's have a quick look uh, at what this does. So, um, no, sorry, uh, maybe I should go back here and just open it. Okay. So, um, well, we, we can even watch the movie. So, what happens is you, you install the cookie cutter package, then you paste this URL, and it will start to ask you a number of questions. First, what is the name of your plugin? Then uh, it will already determine the module name that would fit to this name. You can enter a short description of your plugin. Which entry point prefix do you would, would you like to use? What is your GitHub username? I recommend hosting packages on GitHub. What is the name of the repository? Contact email. Um, which version to start with, and uh, a few more details. And after this, it, it creates a version of this AIDA diff plugin in your local folder that is exactly the same as AIDA diff, uh, but has all the diff and special pieces of information that you saw before replaced by the ones that you provided. So there will be a readme with your email um, and uh, setup.json with the correct uh, entry point, names, etc. So I think, I think we've already seen enough. Let's continue. So then, OK, how do we register a new plugin? And uh, so what do we do here? Yes, so the way to do it, you go to the AIDA plugin registry. We have already seen this a number of times. And then here's a link, register your plugin. You click here, and you will see what the GitHub repository that is used to create this web page. And in this GitHub repository, um, there's a file called plugins.json that contains the information about the plugins. So th the way you do this is you fork this repository. This means simply make a copy of this repository in your uh, GitHub account. I've already done that. Then you will clone the repository. So you can just click here. You can copy the command and do um, git clone, paste the command. I also have already done that. So AIDA registry uh, repository is already here. And then, as I mentioned, there's this plugins.json file. Uh, there's always the problem that this is at the bottom of the, maybe that is easier. Um, so let's have a quick look in how this looks like. So this is, for example, the uh, entry point. This is the reg registration of the Quantum Espresso plugin. Uh, there's a few points, uh, things of information you can provide, like a name, which entry point you want, what is the state of development. Um, again, for the different states of development, you simply look here. Registered, development, or stable. You would start with development. And as I mentioned, I really encourage you to register your plugin early so that other people notice that you are developing the plugin so that they can contact you. Um, and what else? Uh, here we are. Um, a pip URL. Uh, so how should people um, install it via pip? Uh, actually, this could here be replaced by, uh, with something more simple. So if you have your plugin hosted on PyPy, this could be probably just the name of the plugin. Um, the, you need to connect to this setup.json file that I showed before. This is what the AIDA plugin registry uses to get the information about your plugin. Right? So for example, on the plugin registry, again, we, we see, um, let's go back here a few times, one, two. For example, let's say for AIDA diff. For AIDA diff, we see there's a calculation, there's a parser, there's a data, and there's some more. And we also see, if we click here, um, so who are the code authors, what are the entry points, etc. And uh, the AIDA registry uses this setup.json file to create this information. Um, sorry. And um, yeah, so you would probably provide a, here a link to your GitHub repository as the home of your code. And if you have it, a documentation URL. 
All this is uh, <laughs> detailed on the uh, AIDA plugin registry, a uh, plugin registry README file. Do you uh, allow to specify independently the status for the 0 0.12 and the 1.0? Um, no, not yet at the moment, but uh, this is a good point. At some point, we, we need to decide a bit what to do there. So I, I can say a few words about plugin versioning. Um, uh, may maybe I mention it later when, when I show the link to the video where you can actually learn about this. Um, yeah, one word uh, about pre-commit hooks. Um, so pre-commit hooks is something, is a feature of Git. And it allows you to run a program every time you make a git commit. And uh, AIDA diff comes with a number of pre-commit hooks. One that is a formatter. This simply makes sure that your this simply applies a certain style of formatting to your code. So you don't have to worry like if uh, I don't know should I split this over two lines? Do I keep it on one line or? Uh, uh, yeah, things like this. So th this will take care of this for you. Um, then there is a linter. Um, this is very helpful. It can uh, already, when you try committing the code, w without ever having to run it, detect uh, uh, errors using static code analysis. And what I wanted to say here is, um, it, I mean, it also gives you suggestions on things that you should be doing even if it's not sure whether it's really an error. And finally, there's Python Modernize. This is a very useful uh, Python package that helps you write Python 2 and Python 3 compatible code. We use this in AIDA core um, and is part of the pre-commit hooks in the AIDA diff plugin. And <laughs> so the idea is it ensures automatically that your code is Python 2 and Python 3 compatible. Of course, in practice, this is not always true. So there there are some cases where uh, differences between Python 2 and Python 3 um, may require like manual in, um, intervention. In particular, if you're migrating a code that was written in Python 2 to Python 3, there is a, uh, there there's a link on, again, should I uh, quickly go here? Yeah, so there, again, on the plugin, on the tutorials page, there's a link of uh, videos to plugin migration lectures. Um, these in should include, um, uh, I think, uh, some introduction on Python 2 versus Python 3, as well as also some uh, notes that we made on versioning. So the short story is that, well, no, I will come back to that. L l let me quickly go here. And the way you install it is uh, you install the pre-commit extra of the AIDA div package, and then you say pre-commit install. And from then on, every time you, you, you want to make a commit, it will run these tools. So this can be very useful. Um, another re remark I wanted to make is about, is about editors. Um, any Vim people here? A few Vim people. Any Emacs people here? A few Emacs people. <laughs> I'm a Vim person, but uh, I, I don't. <laughs> Uh, I consider Vim and Emacs equal in many regards. So, um, the, I, what I wanted to say is that Vim and Emacs are b highly efficient and flexible text editors, but today there are integrated development environments that offer you tons of convenience features, that some of which you can get in Vim and in Emacs if you know all the details of how to configure an environment. But for most users, it is simply you easier to use one of those. So things they provide is you start typing a variable name, you just autocomplete it. Or you, you have a function, you just click, a function is being used in some class, you don't know wh where is this coming from, you just click on it, it goes directly to the definition of the function. Or um, you have some imports, a lot of import statements in your Python file that you're not actually using. Or you, you made a programming error. Um, or you, you want to debug uh, your code, you can click in in the editor on a line. Say, I want to stop here. You run the t you run you run the code, and it provides you access to inspecting the variables at this point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a bit more effective than print statements. Um, just two examples of IDEs that are being used. For example, here in the AIDA Core Developer Group, 
I think PyCharm was originally uh, more popular. So Pyth PyCharm is, is an integrated development environment focused on Python. There's a free community edition. And the pro edition is free for students. But uh, if you're not a student, you, you, you need to pay. It can be a bit resource hungry. And it can take a bit of time to open PyCharm. Some nice th features of it is that it has a very powerful search everywhere function. So you can just search in your whole code base and list the, the occurrences <coughs> of a string. It actually has a Vim evaluation mode. So if people care about this, you can still use Vim commands in PyCharm. Uh, then um, there's also Visual Studio Code developed by Microsoft. It's not Python specific. It's a multi-programming language. But it has uh, lots of Python specific features. Uh, through some plugin system uh, of Visual Studio Code. It's actually free and open source, which is very nice. Um, it is less resource hungry and faster to open. And it has also a few niceties. Um, I really, this is just a very small subset of things that I found useful. There's many, many more. So you can like, you can hover over a line and can tell you like which git commit was the last one that changed this or like click on a test file in your profile browser to just run these tests and <coughs> these kind of things. Again, there's also more text editors. I don't want to suggest that these two are the, the ones you should be using. But if, you, if you're not using an integrated development environment, and if you're not a super experienced Vim or Emacs user, I think you should consider using them. Um, and just a very final thing. So these are slides from Giovanni, uh, as you can see. Um, so these tests, this test that we just ran, um, I ran it um, on my own, right? So now I, I would make some changes to, to, the, to the plugin. And every time I make changes, I should again run the test to make sure that I did not break my plugin. This is not necessary, uh, if you're, in particular if you're using open source software, because there are free, free online platforms that do this for you for free. Uh, one of them is called Travis CI. Um, so you can go to, sorry, uh, there's no link. You can go to travisci.org. Maybe, maybe I, can, uh, I think it will be changed to travisci.com shortly. Um, and uh, sorry, why doesn't, doesn't didn't it work? Ah, yeah. OK, so the problem is it's a bit difficult for me here to find things. I'm not sure it will find this. OK, so here we are. So I've set this up. So for example, if I click on the AIDA diff repository, um, or even the my fork, let's say on my fork, um, for every commit, um, it runs a number of tests. It runs a test on Python 2.7 with the Django database backend. It runs a test with Python 2.7 and the SQL A uh, database backend. It checks that the pre-commit hooks uh, don't give any errors. And it does the same on Python 3.6. And it builds here another one, which is the documentation. And I can go in here and check that it, it looks exactly as I expect. If there is an error, however, I will be immediately informed via email. So I don't have to go here to actually find out that there's an error. So this was probably a bit older. So it still shows all of these warnings. I disabled them at some point. But in the end, it says three tests pass, 18 warnings in 20 seconds. And how do you enable this? Um, the only thing you need to do is you need to go to your profile. You need to create an account there. You search. You will connect this to your GitHub account. And then you search for AIDA diff or whatever the name of your plugin is. And you just enable this switch. The reason this works is because we already provided Travis configuration inside AIDA diff. Let's have a look here. Um, so Travis is configured uh, using so-called YAML files. YAML is a, um, a file format a bit similar to, uh, to JSON in the sense that it defines keys and values. But it is a bit more human readable. Uh, it allows also comments. Uh, and so it, it is a useful uh, language for configuring such tools. That's also why it's, for example, used to configure uh, Kubernetes and ma many other software infrastructures. And uh, you don't need 
to understand when you start the details of this, this file, uh, this file simply takes care of running all these tests that I showed before. And in principle, um, when you create your, your, your plugin using the plugin cutter, you should be able to just go into travisci.org, enable the switch for your plugin, and from then on, at every commit, well, let's have a look at the commits. Oh, a test failed. So at every commit, it will check whether the tests pass. If they pass, you get a green uh, error, uh, green check mark. And here, apparently, something failed. So for some reason, so okay, this is the Travis CI test. Um, and apparently I broke some other tests that I'm also running. Uh, you, you don't need to know about these. So these are running on Azure pipelines, which is a, is a similar testing framework provided by Microsoft. Um, the configuration file for this is also in the repository, but you don't need to worry about it for the moment. All right, so I think I'm basically done. So can I, how do I get out? Uh, here. Yes. Some final remarks about uh, yeah, the migration to 1.0 that I already gave. There's videos on plugin migration here. There's a plugin migration guide step by step on the AIDA core wiki. In these lectures, there's also, I think, uh, a talk on how we suggest to do versioning. In short, we recommend people to start a new plugin. Um, so, sorry to not support both AIDA 0.12 and AIDA 1.0 in the same plugin, but to increase the major version number. So if you know what semantic versioning is, to increase, if you have a plugin that you're migrating to 1.0, increase the major version number by one. And from then on, support AIDA 1.0 only, uh, while keep supporting, of course, patches for the old version of it, uh, but um, don't try to support both be because in the end ma many of the benefits that you have from AIDA 1.0 would be lost uh, because many of the benefits, uh, some of the benefits that I mentioned are that you will need to write much less code. Uh, you can add these uh, nice uh, Verdi command um, uh, interfaces and so on. Um, yes, so let me see whether there's anything else. I think I'll stop uh, with the slide that you've seen again. Uh, I'll just keep it up here for inspiration. And I'm open for questions now, and if uh, some time for questions now, and then we will also start going around, help you set up, help you getting set up with AIDA, and so on. Yes, you can also um, press the button if you like, but there's the mic. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, why do you decide to keep both Python 2 and Python 3 compatibility? Because nowadays the entire Python community is already dropping, encourage the developer to drop Python 2 support. And why, uh, for what reason, you decide to do that for the project? Well, uh, the thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think the whole Python, the problem is that not the whole Python community has, has dropped Python 2 support, right? So um, uh, I think the idea is simply to be backwards compatible for, the, the thing is all, all plugins somehow have to, uh, if you say there's only Python 3 and there's one plugin there's Python 2, it, it cannot do anything. So um, we, w we simply wanted to make it easier for, uh, for developers and and the other thing is that using uh, Python Modernize uh, is actually not too much of a hassle. So I, I don't actually write like Python 2, 3 compatibility code. This, this is handled f for me by Python Modernize. I mean, you as a plugin developer are free to decide. I'm only going to support Python 3. And uh, as Giovanni mentioned, at some point in 2020, we are going to drop Python 2 support. For the moment, uh, we we still uh, we still support it, and um, yeah. A and if it's not too much work, I would su suggest uh, you support it as well. If you think it's too much work, don't do it. 